Oh, how's it going, everybody? I, am, I have been up for literally 24 hours. I woke up 24 hours ago in Taipei, flew for a long time with a 14-month-old baby, including a three-hour mechanical-related layover in Tokyo that was unexpected. So I may collapse in the middle of this presentation. Uh, so my name is Josh Wills. I'm the director of data engineering at Slack. Uh, I've, been there, I've been at Slack for about a year. Uh, before that, I was at Cloudera for a few years. I was at Google for a few years before that. I was at other places for some indeterminate amount of time before that. Uh, I wrote a popular tweet once that you've probably seen at some point in your life, but I don't really want to talk about it anymore. And I only own that one hat, which was actually stolen from me at the last uh, WrangleConf. WrangleConf is a machine learning conference, data science conference that I host. It's the only conference I prefer to, to MLConf. Um, but anyway, someone, I guess, Rang, not wrangled, rustled, rustled it from me, actually, at the, at the last time I had it. So I missed that hat a great deal. I don't know what I'm going to do without it. Uh, I used to talk a lot. This is the only, like, this is only the second conference I've spoken at in the past year. And I used to, like, speak professionally uh, about, about data science and about data engineering, about machine learning and all this kind of great stuff. Uh, and I don't really do it anymore, and so I'm a little bit out of practice, because I have a real job now where I'm actually, like, responsible for things roadmaps and deliverables and JIRA and all that kind of horrible stuff. And I don't know why I went back to get a real job. Like literally, I don't know if it's like the sleep deprivation from, from the flight, but I, I literally cannot remember why I thought it was a good idea to give up my fake job of just going around and, and talking about stuff and telling people how they ought to work and going back and actually having to do the real work again. Um, but it's been, it's been an education, that's for sure. Um, so. The stuff I'm going to talk about today, uh, let's see, Slack's data engineering team is just a little bit over a year old. And so this conference is really, I love this conference because this, you know, the signal to noise ratio is so high, that was my quote, because it just, it brings together, in my opinion, the best sort of industry focused academics and the most like academically interesting industry people. Like that's sort of, that's, that, those are my favorite people, that intersection of those two sets, that's where all the good conferences are. Um, and my talk is not going to in involve any of that interesting stuff whatsoever because at Slack we're still trying to figure out how to like count stuff, right? We're like at the very like fundamental like phase of building stuff that's way before you get to do anything remotely interesting. Um, so I'm going to talk about fairly boring stuff for a while and do my best to make it sound interesting. Um, Slack's mission, uh, everyone, everyone here knows what Slack is, right? I'm in San Francisco, I don't have to explain what Slack is. It's like, it's like Kafka but for people, roughly speaking. Um, <laughs> Uh, Slack's mission is to make people's working lives simpler, more pleasant, and more productive. That is, that is what we set out to do. Um, I just clicked this slide, but I don't think anything happened. There we go. Um, so we are not an ad tech company, and we are not a fintech company. Um, we are not Netflix. Uh, people pay us like money, believe it or not, surprisingly often, um, on a monthly subscription basis to use advanced enterprise-y features of our product. Um, and so there's not like an obvious, like Slack doesn't have an obvious spam problem. We don't have an, I mean, it does have a little bit of a spam problem, but it's not super obvious. We don't, you know, worry so much about like getting people to click on ads. We don't really worry so much about like fraud, credit card fraud, click fraud, any of that kind of stuff. And yet, despite all that, we are investing a lot in data infrastructure and analytics and machine learning. Um, and that is something that takes, I think, a fair amount of courage to do for companies that are not in the ad tech, fintech sort of space. Um, because basically, like doing data right, doing data seriously has very, very high fixed costs in terms of you know my time and all the time of the people we hire to work on this stuff, in terms of the infrastructure, in terms of the cost we impose on the engineering team, all, all that kind of stuff. It comes with a very, very high fixed cost, um, and the payout is is somewhat non-obvious, right? It's it's basically like pulling a slot machine. Um, so I, one of the things I like to say is that. That data is this heavily, heavily portfolio-driven business. We're going to do 500 different things this year with data at Slack. One of those things will pay for all of the others. Oh, God, I am so sorry. Ooh. One of them will pay for my, my spatial depth perception is not going to be super great. Again, I count on not having slept for 24 hours. Um, one of the things we do will pay for all of the other stuff we do. I don't know which thing it's going to be. I have no idea, but one of those things is going to basically drive almost all of the returns. A lot of it is just going to be a pointless, silly waste of time. And that is the nature of data, 
And, and that, is, that is a sort of hard, hard thing to live with. That is a tough truth to live with. If you are at Google or Facebook or Netflix or, or any of these companies, you are already well on the other side of the portfolio. You've been doing this stuff for years and you've gotten the payoff. You understand the returns. For a company like Slack that's only like two and a half years old and has only been doing data stuff for like a year to make this kind of investment, it takes, uh, it takes an act of faith, I suppose, I guess, for lack of a better term. Um, so, you know, that's an enormous amount of pressure, I guess, is what I'm saying. Like, it's, it's, a hard, it's a hard thing to do. It's a hard thing to work in. Um, so one of the things I struggle with, and I, I want to talk about this a little bit, um, I used to work at Google. Uh, a lot of our analysts used to work at Facebook. A lot of our machine learning engineers are ex-Google people, ex-Foursquare people. Um, we have a lot of ex-Twitter people. We know what really good data infrastructure looks like. We've worked with really good data infrastructure, really good infrastructure, really good tools, really good machine learning models. We know what the end state is, and we know where we are right now. And we can see the gap, like the fairly massive gap between where we are and where we know the good state is, where we know like what happiness looks like. Um, and the hardest problem I have every single day is trading off, investing in building towards a future and a vision of what the world, like what the great happy end state will be and solving the problem I have on my plate today that is like causing actual pain or costing actual money or whatever that I need to solve in order to be able to get to that end state. So balancing the trade-off between those two things is, is the hardest part of my job. It's, it's hard in a way that I really didn't appreciate back when I was give, doing this fake job of just going around and talking about the vision and talking about the end state without actually having to be invested in building that end state myself. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about, about that more going forward, but that's, that's, that's the hard problem of doing this stuff from the ground up in a new place. I want to talk briefly about org stuff. Um, data at Slack is really divided between three different functions that are in three different business units, believe it or not. We have an analytics team that reports up through like our business, marketing, customer experience team. Uh, we have the data engineering team, which reports up, not surprisingly, through the data team. And then we have SLI, which is our New York-based machine learning team um, that kind of lives off in a sort of other real organizational bubble. I don't honestly know where they report. Um, it, it's not like a lab, per se. Like, it, it, like, like, you know, working in a lab is sort of like a pejorative thing to say in some sense. It means you don't work on, like, real product and real problems. Apologies to everyone in the room who works at a lab. Sorry about that. Um, they work on real projects and they work on real problems, but they are like an independent function. Um, Daniel Tunkelong has this excellent, excellent O'Reilly Radar blog post about how should you organize your data scientists? How should you organize your data team? Should you split them up across various business units? Should you like centralize them together? And my experience has been that the, Daniel's, Daniel's blog post is incredibly useful, but it's incredibly useful because it's descriptive as opposed to prescriptive. And, and what I mean by that is, it's rarely it's rare to find an organization where the data teams have enough power to actually reshape the org structure, <laughs> right? Org structure is driven by like executive level politics that are just so mind-numbingly tedious and boring that I kind of want to kill myself thinking about them. Um, there's not really a lot a data team can do to reshape how they're organized. Um, what you really need to do is sort of look at the way you're organized, which reflects whatever executive level, CTO, CEO, oh God, I am just keep doing it, this is terrible, um, relationships you have, and then basically deal with the sort of fallout of how things are organized. Like do your best and sort of work around the limitations of how you're organized based on the information in Daniel's blog post. Yeah, all right. Let's talk a little about the history of this stuff. Um, so in the beginning, uh, in summer of 2014, uh, Slack hired a guy named Josh Pritchard from, uh, who was, I, mean, I think he, he was early at Facebook, so he's basically just kind of hanging out, I think, at this point, um, to come like be the head of analytics and start doing forecasting, like basically lots and lots of very SQL intensive work against like replicas of the production data. So like run cron jobs on the production MySQL databases, compute summary stats, dump them off in MySQL, and then you know, build dashboards and visualizations and forecasting models and all that kind of good stuff, right? So very, very SQL heavy, like very kind of, you know, like, like small data analysis, like Slack wasn't very big at the time, you could easily do this stuff, it wasn't really that big of a deal. Um, so yeah, that goes on for like the better part of a year. 
And then uh, we hired a data engineering team. Um, there was one engineer who was hired before me, and then I was hired, and then we started hiring a bunch more data engineers, and we have, I guess, seven of us all together at the moment. Um, and we built, we built Slack's kind of early data warehouse infrastructure. And we run a, a very much like Netflix-inspired model. Um, all of our data is in S3. All of it is in Parquet. There's a centralized Hive Metastore. We spin up clusters as we need them to do various things. We tear them down. We don't really worry about it too much. Um, we replicate data from our production MySQL systems via a big orchestration layer called Scooper. It's just a very thin layer around Scoop that does all this massive orchestration stuff to copy all this data every single night. Um, we write thrift logs over Kafka. We dump them in S3 using um, Pinterest's C-Core library, which is um, has no documentation or logging whatsoever, but is very reliable and robust once you fucking figure out how to make it work. So highly recommended. Um, yeah. And then we run a combination of Hive, Spark, and Presto uh, jobs in order to do analytics, interactive analytics, machine learning, basic data processing, all that kind of good stuff. We, we dump some small tables into MySQL, uh, and we coordinate all the stuff with Airflow from Airbnb. So this, this, is, this is our stack. It's a fairly standard 2015, 2016 era data stack. And this is like what I set out to do. This is like we basically, we set out to build this stuff, me and the other early data engineers. Um, and this was like our, took up our first six months or so, building out all this kind of infrastructure. And you know, I was thinking about it, I was kind of reflecting on the past year. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen, I was, I was just in Taiwan, so I'm, I'm just, I, have, I have, you know, China and, and, and Taiwan and stuff on the mind. Y'all ever heard about the ghost cities in China? China has built these massive, massive cities where no one lives, just basically like planning for a future where people will just show up and move in there, and they're just, they're just ghost towns. It's kind of eerie, creepy. And that was basically our early data warehouse, <laughs> for all intents and purposes. It was, it was the ghost city. Like, there was data there. There were a lot of tools you could use to use it, right? But our entire analytics team was very much like MySQL-centric. They had built kind of their early cron jobs, right? They could run stuff. They could do sort of fairly basic things. They weren't really all that interested in the data that the logs contained. They didn't really care much about user agents or geolocations off of IP addresses or anything like that. Um, and so, like, it was just so unbelievably, insanely frustrating to me for, like, about three months there, like, cajoling, begging, pleading the SQL-heavy analysts, carrots, sticks, threats, stalking them, following them home from work, whatever it took to get them to use, get them to basically move into the ghost city that we had built. Um, and, you know, we sort of realized this was kind of a problem, um, and so we decided to sort of get the band back together, so to speak. Um, it's a joke that, like, I think about 5% of the audience got. It's fine. <laughs> Kids these days. Um, we, we started staffing up, right? We started hiring analysts and machine learning people from Google and Facebook and Twitter and all the people who knew what data infrastructure was supposed to look like and expected it to exist and it just basically came in and knew how to work with it right away. Um, and that was really the key. That was how we populated our ghost city. We brought in people who were used to working this way, used to working using these tools um, in a way that our existing analysts were not and had them teach and train our analysts to be able to do this stuff and work this way. And so it's one of the things I just really did not appreciate at all in back in my fake job was the extent to which hiring is like everything. <laughs> it's sort of trite to say, but hiring is everything. Hiring shifts the culture. Hiring shifts the way you work. Um, hiring is so insanely important. It is like absolutely everything you do, and that's, that's been just so key uh, to all of the work we've done. I want to say, you, you know, among the things it's hardest to hire for, I'm, I'm paying like literally no attention to the clock, so I'm probably just ranting on here. Yeah, it's not good. Um, hardest thing to hire for are machine learning engineers. Super, super hard to hire machine learning engineers. There's only like, I guess there's only like, I think there's like three kinds of machine learning engineers, roughly speaking. Um, there are machine learning engineers who are working on machine learning problems they love and they're super happy solving. Um, and they just find deeply enjoying and pleasurable and they're, they're at Google and Netflix and Facebook and all these places. And they've already done all the really tedious, awful legwork of logging things and tuning models and getting stuff running and all that kind of great stuff and they're just super happy. Um, there are people who are, think machine learning is cool, but have never actually done it before and don't know how terrible it actually is. It's a lot of these people. I think looking around the room, everyone's nodding, right? We have done a terrible job as an industry of communicating to the rest of the world how horrible our jobs are. Like we sound 
we really do not like you until you're it's like three o'clock in the morning and you're like tuning a spark model for the umpteenth billionth time you don't really know how horrible machine learning is i have discovered though it's kind of cool if you can convince an engineer they're doing machine learning you can get them to do literally anything you want <laughs> it's amazing it's very true it's like one of those things right that is that is sort of like the key to recruiting and hiring so they got is how do i trick this person into thinking they're doing machine learning when really they're just like logging stuff and building a dashboard for me truly a management art form that is worthy of a talk itself. Anyway, and then there's the third kind. And the third kind we've been very fortunate to hire. This is, this is the folks that I recommend looking out for. Underutilized machine learning engineers. <laughs> Google and Facebook and Netflix have so many machine learning engineers who are wasted on the products they're working on. Like they're working on things that are silly and ridiculous and they should not be working on them and they should come do consequential things at companies like Slack where there's a lot of consequential work to be done. <laughs> Is that subtle enough? I don't know. So, yeah. um, so anyway, it's hard to find them. It really is. It's super hard to find them, but they are, they are the best, and we've been very fortunate to hire quite a few of them. All right. Um, so that's, that's the good thing. That's how we filled in our ghost city. We hired people who knew what they were doing, who knew how to work. The problem, though, this is sort of everything, every good thing has sort of a horrible negative consequence. Um, the horrible negative consequence of hiring all these people um, was th they say stuff like, well, at Facebook, a lot. Something like half their sentences begin with, well, at Facebook. Well, when I was at Facebook, we did it this way. Well, when I was at Facebook, we had this tool. Well, when I was at Facebook, blah, blah, blah just on and on and on, all the time. I just kind of want to kill myself. Um, and I mean, to a certain extent, it's penance for me because I spent four years going around saying, well, at Google, blah, 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 well, at Google, right? So I deserve this, I had it coming. Um, I don't, I don't want to like say that. And I take some solace in knowing that four years from now, they will be the head of analytics or the head of data science at, at the next great hot company. And they will hire a team of analysts and data scientists who work for them and come in and tell them, well, it's Snapchat. Well, it's Snapchat. Well, it's Snapchat. So that's, it, it's a cycle. It's, it's the way these things go. Um, but the hard thing for coming in from like Google or Facebook or whatever is all these problems that have been solved years ago that are just like oxygen, like you don't even realize they're problems anymore, are not solved at Slack. And so we have to solve them um, and it takes up a lot of time. It's just a lot of work, right? Um, and they come in and they have preferences for tools. We, we, we and our data engineering team um, wrote our own ETL workflow engine. Um, it was basically the first thing the very first data engineer did when he was hired about a month or so before I could stop him from doing it, unfortunately. Um, and it was actually a really good, very elegant, Go-based, like beautiful workflow engine, just, just gorgeous, because there's nothing more fun than running a workflow engine. Um, but it didn't really have great visibility, right? And it didn't really have great monitoring, and it wasn't what the Facebookers were used to using and stuff like that. And so we went through this kind of arduous, painful migration to Airflow. Like the actual migration itself took like a week, um, but the emotional, like, you know what I mean? Like the kind of feeling, stuff that I'm just not very good at. It took like two months or so, roughly speaking, to get everyone kind of together. Um, but broadly speaking, like Airflow has been fantastic for us. Um, and I just want to give a, just a general shout out to the Airbnb team for doing all of the wonderful, wonderful stuff they have done for data infrastructure, for everyone, machine learning, Airflow, um, Caravel, all this really great stuff that Airbnb does that is just really setting the standard for how data should be done basically everywhere, in my opinion. If everyone was running like Airbnb, we'd be in a vastly better world. Um, and so anyway, this was really just an excuse for me to make that whole, well, it's Snapchat, well, it's Snapchat, well, it's Snapchat joke. So I'm gonna move on, all right. And then finally, I wanna talk a little about the nature of the work. Um, this is concept I love of, of um, Oda Loops, observe, orient, decide, act. This is a military concept that was developed by a guy named John Boyd back in the 70s. Observe, orient, decide, act. Um, everything we do in data is about observing, like logging stuff. Like logging stuff is where everything begins. We can't optimize, we can't model stuff that we don't, data that we don't have. It's just that basic, right? Orientation is about coming up with metrics, using our context, our knowledge, what are we trying to do, combine that data together into a system that we can reason about, make decisions based on that sort of stuff, and then act upon it. Run experiments, build models, create new metrics, have meetings occasionally. Um, replace those meetings with better machine learning models, whatever is required, right? And this is, this is the fundamental work. Um, and I think like 
again, sort of modular the people who don't actually do machine learning, like who don't really do machine learning but think they want to do machine learning, they imagine that this data that they're observing is done <laughs> and the metric just exists. And all they have to do is go sit off in a corner and run scikit-learn for a while and just kind of play and visualize with data and then easily deploy the model to production. And that is the problem. That is the problem. If you, if you believe that, if that is your mental conception of what machine learning is, then I totally get why you want to do it, but that isn't actually the job. <laughs> that is not even close to the job. The job is you go in there and you do the logging. And you go in there and you build the dashboard and you figure out what the metrics are. And then you build this sort of massive pipeline for computing the model. And guess what? The machine learning bit of it is about five minutes or so in about six months worth of work. And that's a really good five minutes, don't get me wrong. It's, it's a, but I mean, you gotta be mindful that you really, you should at least be able to tolerate the other like six months minus five minutes before you like just, just d divide, dive into a career in machine learning. Okay, this is like basically, like all my talks are me just basically scolding people who aren't even in the room, you know? It's just terrible. Well, we're gonna record this and then I'll be able, they'll be able to be scolded via YouTube, so it's fine, all right. That's all great. Okay, I've got like six seconds left. Let's talk a little bit about the product problem. Um, we don't sell saddles. We don't sell saddles. There's a great medium, uh, medium blog post that Stuart, wrote, Stuart Butterfield, our CEO, wrote a few years ago. We don't sell saddles. And it's all about Slack's product strategy um, and how we sell. We don't sell a group chat application. We sell better team collaboration. We sell reductions in emails and meetings and all that kind of stuff. We, we sell productivity. That's what we sell. We don't sell the product, we sell the solution to the problem. And it's just really, really well written, as, as a lot of stuff that Stuart does is. And I, I try to keep that sort of like focus in mind when I think about what does data and machine learning need to do at Slack? What is the product problem we are trying to solve? Slack is a great, great group chat application. And a lot of people use Slack exclusively as a group chat application. And that's totally fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but you don't need data and machine learning to build a really good chat application. We know what a really good chat application is supposed to look like. In fact, I find things like, like Facebook today is now recommending links to me to share in my, in my feed. And that's like just super annoying. <laughs> like I don't want, I don't, it's not what I want. I want simple. It's heavy, heavy on the simple when it comes to the group chat application. It should just be really, really simple. Um, but people don't pay us money to use a group chat application. Um, people pay Slack money because, because over time, after using it across the company, across the team, over a period of months or years or whatever, Slack becomes their knowledge base. It becomes the source of truth. And many, for many companies, it is the company. It's like Slack is the office for a lot of remote companies. Um, so everything we can do to make that transition from Slack as group chat application to Slack as knowledge base, Slack of, as the searchable log of all conversation and knowledge, that is what we need to focus on from a data perspective. That's, that's like our entire goal. Um, and so as a result of this, there's a lot of amazing machine learning being done right now. It's like overwhelming all the stuff. Like while I was standing here talking, 250 papers were published on archive, like just now, about new machine learning models, new deep learning models. This is an incredibly exciting time. Um, but it doesn't help us to use the latest and greatest model if we're not solving the right product problem. If we're not, you know, like otherwise we're basically selling saddles for all intents and purposes. Um, so given that, what do minimum viable data products look like? And how do we balance solving the problem of the here and now with the long-term vision of what we know is possible and what we know is necessary? And so this is sort of ripped off from like minimum viable products in general. You don't build a car, you don't buy a car in a sort of growth-oriented minimum viable way by building a wheel and then an axle and then a base and then a car because the customer is really angry the whole way through until he gets his fully functioning car. First you build a skateboard, then you build a scooter, then you build a bicycle, then you build a motorcycle, then you build a car make them slightly less pissed off at every step of the pipeline, broadly speaking. And that's, that's minimum viable data products as well. Um, one of the first things we did, just because I'm so passionate about it, and it was so core to the culture, was introducing A-B testing and experimentation. Like, when I got to Slack, we had a very reactive culture when it came to experimentation. It was like, hey, new team creation fell 20% yesterday. Why did that happen? <laughs> I wish I was kidding. It's kind of like a sort of like silent in the room. Everyone's like, yeah, we've all been there. It's horrible, right? We don't know why things are doing. We're not, we're not sort of proactively changing things and monitoring metrics and seeing how things react, right? So the very, very first thing we did was build a brain dead simple A-B testing, logging, 
dashboard infrastructure so we could start running growth experiments. We could start seeing what makes new teams successful, knowing full well that we were going to need to be able to run experiments on ranked systems, where we were doing interleaved experiments, where we were mixing and matching results from different recommendation engines and different search ranking models and all that kind of good stuff. But right now, today, we needed to make the growth team productive. And we needed to shift them into a data and metric-centric mindset um, so we could get away from this model of, I know it ought to be like this, or we're just going to go do this and launch this. Moving away from like launching features to moving metrics. That was like just the very first thing we did. Um, Andrea Burbank from Pinterest has a wonderful, wonderful talk on how to do this that is just so, so much better than anything I could do. Um, I highly recommend looking it up on, on uh, YouTube. She actually gave it at Wrangle uh, two years ago, and it's just absolutely, absolutely amazing talk on how she introduced experiments at Pinterest or how the team there developed an experiments culture. So that's like thing one. Um, for machine learning products, you wrote a blog post about this recently. This is, this is our channel recommendations feature. And unless you're in some large, large Slack teams, you probably don't ever see this. Um, but for people who are in very large Slack teams, um, noise is the most common complaint we get. People are overwhelmed with Slack, or they can be overwhelmed with Slack. There's so much stuff going on. There's a lot of FOMO. Um, and so we introduced it to channel recommendations product to maybe recommend channels that you should join, and in many cases, more importantly, recommend channels that you should leave. And this is a very simple model. It's like item to item similarity, a little bit of linear regression, a little bit of k-nearest neighbors, right? It's not rocket science. It's a very simple model we can build on the metadata we have about how people interact with each other and how people interact with channels inside of Slack. And that, if you think about it, is really like the most foundational data product we can build. Understanding relationships between people, that is like the most, that is our competitive advantage. That is our, that is our secret sauce. That is our very best data. Understanding those relationships will help us do things like channel summarization, things like way better search ranking, but building just the minimum viable foundational data product that can be launched in, a, in like honestly in a fairly simple way. Like this is, this is, you get a weekly notification from Slackbot saying here are some channels we think you should join, here are some channels you think we think you should leave. We get better data, we feed that into the model, we basically start building the flywheel, and we use the sort of resulting data product we create across six or seven other data products we plan to build going forward. It's, it's that kind of like product strategy around data that is super, super important, way more so than using any given magic algorithm or what your tech stack is or anything like that. It's really all about the product problem. Um, along with that, we basically built um, a big giant key value store, uh, sort of a static key value store. I think a lot of people have built this thing over the time. Um, Netflix calls this the Hulk model. Um, where essentially you don't build a real-time machine learning model. You build a giant, enormous batch model, um, and you just serve it statically. And then you just use it in real time, and you update it every 24 hours. The nice thing about Slack is that we are a lot like Netflix. Your relationship with other people and your relationship with channels doesn't change very much day to day in the same way that your opinion about movies doesn't change very much day to day, like that kind of thing. And so we can get away with building these giant, enormous batch models and then deploying them out for serving in production. It's just way cheaper, way simpler, and way faster to build. Highly, highly recommended. And uh, yeah, along those lines, last but not least, Netflix really set the standard on how we run. Like their, their papers, their thoughts on the way they use Parquet, Presto, the way they, they use EMR clusters have just been an inspiration to us. We cannot thank them enough. Um, Airbnb, we use AirPal. We mess around with Caravel, and we love Airflow. If y'all aren't using Airflow, is anyone not using Airflow? Y'all need to get on that right now. Like Airflow is, Airflow is the shit. Airflow is the thing. Like, like Airflow is the future for everybody. Um, Pinterest, Modulo, my hatred of C-Core. Hate, love, hate, slash relationship with C-Core. Like we, you know, we'd be like lost without it. And then Foursquare uh, wrote a system called Quiver that we use as the backing for our, our giant Hulk, big, big key value serving model. It's been super helpful for us. And we cannot thank these companies enough. It is so fortunate. We are so blessed to be able to build a lot of this stuff from scratch using the best practices provided by the companies that employ a lot of people in this room. So thank you, thank you all very much. And obviously we're hiring, because does is the machine learning conference. Um, thank you very, very much, I appreciate it. Thank you.